Earlier this month, the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign and the Poor People's Army filed a lawsuit against the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development over attempts to evict people from homes in Philadelphia. The group said it is housing more than 30 families across Philly in abandoned properties, a practice that's been in place by our next guest for over three decades. Joining us now to discuss the lawsuit is the National Coordinator for the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign, Sherry Honkala, and Pastor Keith Collins with the Poor People's Army. Welcome, both of you. So, Sherry, I want to start with you on this one. So you're saying that the there is this attempt to evict these people who are being housed in these abandoned homes, and you're saying that they're doing this in order to take the homes over. Is that right? We have the families in there because there's 10 abandoned properties for every homeless family in Philadelphia. And the shelters have been at capacity and people don't want to expose their children to COVID and uh, want to stay alive right now. So we've been taking over abandoned properties and putting them in these properties that are owned by the federal government. And Pastor, can you give us a little bit of history on, on this program and what types of properties we're talking about? Well, we're talking about properties that were designated by the federal government to house those that had the most uh, desperate, most uh, urgent need of housing. So we're not talking about people who, I mean, these aren't condos. Um, this isn't in the you know, side hill or the upper echelon of Philadelphia. These are properties uh, built by HUD, owned by HUD to house those individuals that come within the poverty margins. However, they're being, uh, they're, they're empty. All the utilities are on, and we believe that they're speculating for the uh, real estate investors and speculators. They'd rather keep them empty and uh, he heated and, and, and electric on rather than house people who have a desperate need of housing. That's very interesting. That was going to be my question. What is, what is the rationale for not allowing them to be used in the interim? Do you think it's purely so they could potentially show them to real estate developers? Yes, there's well, been Philadelphia, a yeah, yeah, Philadelphia is a real estate, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's a real estate paradise now. I mean, the property values are going through the roof. It's being gentrified at warp, warp, warp speed. So uh, we would say yes, but I'll let Sherry speak to that. Um, we recently had a whistleblower from uh, the sheriff's department. He's actually a deputy sheriff that has stepped forward and is going to be testifying in our case that um, many of the real a lot of the real estate in Philadelphia coming out of like the sheriff's department has been used as a slush fund um, for politicians in the Democratic Party here. And um, there's so many properties that have been, you know, just given away uh, to different uh, political alignments here in the Philadelphia area and not to low income and poor people. There's virtually no place for anybody to live anymore. Um, if you are a poor or a working class family in Philly. So there, there's been a, a progressive surge in Philadelphia over the past couple of election cycles with a with a number of candidates getting elected either at large or to city, you know, city council seats. Uh, you know, who, who identify with either the Democratic Socialists of America or other kind of left wing movements, Working Families Party. Uh, how has that in how has that influenced this this fight? Is there is there a base of power within the system that you're able to work from uh, or, or are you just going right up against the entire system? Well, those of us that are in the Poor People's Army see ourselves as um, uh, more towards independence. Um, we see that both the Democratic and the Republican Party um, receive most of their money from corporate America. And those are the very people that we've been fighting. Um, we think that people should have other opportunities, other choices other than Pepsi and Coke. Um, and right now we have a system that's not working. Um, people that uh, are in wheelchairs, people that have life and death uh, medical issues, um, you name it, they have no place to live anymore in Philadelphia. Well, and I have to imagine this is not a, just a Philadelphia issue, but major cities all over the country that are seeing gentrification and development that is just pushing 
those living in poverty or just above the poverty line to the outskirts of the city and just I mean this is a real crisis around the country have you are there groups that you work with um, in different d other cities where this is an issue as well well the poor people's army is actually national and we have been uh, busy since 10 million people have not been able to pay their rent in January. So we've been holding Zoom educationals and going to different locations around the country and teaching people how to do housing takeovers there. Um, because we had a group of cartographers that basically mapped out across this country if we wanted to end homelessness, we could in the amount of properties that just remained vacant. So how is this eviction moratorium affecting uh, what is happening? You know, we do know that there is a moratorium until, uh, what, what what's the date on that, Ryan? When does it end? October 2nd. At this, October 2nd. So we have this for now. Is that sort of, is, is that something you're able to rely on for a moment? And then what about, you know, all of the landlords that are now starting to try and uh, overturn that? I mean, what's what's happening on that front? Sherry, I'll Pastor. go ahead and let you answer that one. Oh, go okay. ahead, Pastor. Um, you know, uh, right now there's so many slum lords um, across this country, so the moratorium really hasn't impacted that. Literally, every uh, day we have dozens and dozens of new people, pregnant women, people in wheelchairs, you name it, that don't have a place to go. And we're starting the new Underground Railroad and we're taking over as many properties as possible and moving them in. The dam is going to break on October 2nd. And we think that, um, you know, we uphold a higher law and that's one of humanity and keeping people alive. So we are not going to let people die on the streets of our country, especially a country that has the kind of riches and abundance that this country has. And I don't think that anybody wants to have children out on the streets um, when we're dealing with COVID and children under 12 not being able to get a vaccine. So um, many people like Pastor Collins and many other people from uh, the, the faith community and people that just have morals and values have said, you know, this is enough. And so they're willing to step forward and uh, help us take the boards off these abandoned properties and house these families. Hmm. Uh, Pastor, I wanna kind of uh, turn to you on this one, but housing discrimination continues to deepen the racial gap when it comes to home ownership. And even though President Biden has been working to revive anti-discrimination regulations that have been gutted under former President Trump, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, the number of black homeowners is 30.5% uh, lower than white Americans and 22% lower than the national rate. So a deeper investigation into the Philly metro area found it to be the 13th most racially segregated metro out of the 100 largest metros. How do you, pastors, think that uh, state and local governments could begin to address this? Well, I think that it's something that if it was going to be addressed by the government, it would have been addressed by the government. I think that it's up to faith practitioners to step out of their uh, lofty uh, pulpits and constructs and get in this uh, fight. However, uh, I'll hasten to say that most of much much of our faith is uh, transactional and not transformative. Uh, sadly, we have state-sponsored clergy and not spirit-sponsored clergy. I say that because when we had the famous uh, homeless encampments in Philadelphia, when they came to uh, relocate and they came to disrupt the encampments, the clergy came. The, the clergy that works hand in hand with the state, with the city of Philadelphia, and uh, not only Philadelphia, but around America. You know, we could end this problem uh, if we just did, if we hadn't gone to Afghanistan, we could have solved this problem. Uh, we, we need clergy uh, that's not like the rich young ruler that Jesus talked to, who, who had an outward sense of morality and had done all the transactions, but was not transformed. 
and Christ told him, sell, sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Not because he was against having wealth, but because he hadn't been transformed. I think that this won't happen until we have clergy that believes in transformation and not just transaction. We must, we must, we must compel the government, as Dr. King uh, wanted to do in his 1968 campaign, uh, to go back to D.C. and claim these rights uh, as well as reparations for the poor. So until we get clergy, uh, mainstream clergy, white clergy, mainstream black clergy to do this, um, no matter who is in government, whether it's a Democrat or Republican, I think we're going to get more of the same. Maybe just a few little uh, olive branches extended. Now, what, what kind of response do you get, Pastor, when, when, you, tr when, you, when you push that argument to other clergy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, when you push this type of argument, you don't get a lot. You, you, you don't get a lot of response from, as I said, traditional clergy. But you do get a response from people that have been in traditional ministries, members, uh, practitioners who want to want to do more. They want to hear more. They want to get more engaged. So we're finding that as we take this message, as Sherry said, like the Underground Railroad, we have to actually um, we have to actually get past sometimes the mainstream clergy to some of their membership and some of their those people that are actually hurting that even um, the clergy is not aware of or, or does not uh, take the initiative to actually engage. So we're taking this message past the traditional uh, clergy route and going straight to the people because the power is indeed in the people. Well, uh, Sherry, thank you so much. And Pastor Keith, thank you so much for, for joining us and talking about this really important issue. Thank, thank you. you. All right. And we have more Rising that's coming up next.